<laughs> a fistful of data's the stargazer's doctor and spittlebugs on the pinos hey everybody and welcome to the seventh rule with sirak lofton hello hello my name is ryan t husk and today we are doing a review of season one episode two of star trek picard it is called maps and legends also directed by Hannah Culpepper again. I believe they're doing two episodes per director. How are you, Sirach? <clears throat> I'm doing good. Maps and Legends, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing all right. This episode was uh, pretty good. I, yeah, I it, was it. A, it was a fun one. It was cool. Um, the reason I said a fistful of data is, by the way, that is a next generation uh, reference. Because there was an episode called Fistful of Datas, which was a play on a fistful of dollars, the Western uh, Clint Eastwood thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that we said that is because there's a whole bunch of androids that this episode opens up with. It opens up on just a ton of data-like androids. And I believe you drew a picture of what was on the back of the guy's head, right? Yeah, the uh, F8 with the d downward triangle nice. um nice little tattoo that they had on the back of his head uh i guess a signifier but i just thought it was cool because it had fate it says fate right exactly yeah um hell what, yeah what hell yeah <laughs> yeah that's the first thing he said did you have fun last night hell yeah <laughs> hell yeah <laughs> and i like that i thought it was a great opening because you know it just Contrast what you see of this android, this synthetic robotic looking person, right? Mm -hmm. And he comes off and he has so much personality. That you're like, oh, all right, this is interesting. I like that. Um, they started off on that Mars colony, which I enjoyed the uh, opening special effects, kind of them going into pulling down into the camera, finding their way into this one particular cubby hole that they're on. Um, I thought it was a really good intro, uh, and I liked this episode. Now, they came off of the tail end of Picard doing the interview, talking about what happened on... Right. So on it's like a flashback, yeah. This is a flashback, right? This is, this is what happened. Yeah, I believe so, yeah. What? And you know uh, uh, what's brown and sticky, right? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, I definitely do. Uh, <laughs> well, that was the joke. They said a stick. <laughs> a stick, yeah. yeah. That was the joke they told uh, F8, yeah. and he was just like, I, I don't get I don't it. Get it. Said, whatever it was. Um, yeah. But yeah, so it opens up with those guys, um, and the robots, you know, they kind of, or the androids, I should say, uh, they turn on them like, and, and there was on, another cool little nod to data, which was when the, the Android's typing, he's typing like super fast. And that's something that uh, data does as well. That was one of his special powers when Picard would be like, come out of data, blah, 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 blah. You know, he'd say something, data would be like, I'm on it, blah, 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 you know, and knock it out <laughs> super fast, you know? Yeah, yeah. So those were all good nods to him. Uh, and it was also good that he was, while he was doing his little super fast data fingers, and somebody runs up behind him, uh, he neutralizes him and like, you know, while he's still typing. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, multitasking. Um, multitasking, you know? Um, but I like the costumes and the feel of that little, small little area that they were in. It felt like a, I don't know, a mining site or something that you would have on a, a startup colony you know, on Mars, so it looked something yeah. legitimate, you know, and I liked the, the set design, the costumes in that particular uh, format. I thought it was real. I mean, you know, it gave a look. There's also something I wanted to touch on. Um, might as well just jump on it right here because the, the next scene goes to Picard at home with his two Romulan friends, helpers, employees, <laughs> refugees, all of the above. And it got me thinking, and I know this is how Star Trek fans like to nitpick, but at first we thought, well, what, what's the deal here? Romulans no longer have these forehead pieces because Romulans in the original series were just kind of like 
people, right? Then in Next Generation and further, you know, series, they kind of had like the forehead ridges and kind of distortions on their forehead on top of the, the eyebrows and the ears. Um, and then when I watched this, I said, hey, where's the, where's the forehead piece? You know, and I know not a lot of Star Trek people notice that too. And their hair, they don't have the bulk cut anymore. They're just like these hipster dudes. You know, they got, they all got long curly hair with pointy ears. They just look like Elrond from Lord of the Rings or whatever. But then in this episode, I noticed something I hadn't noticed, which was some of the Romulans do still have these forehead ridges. I noticed it on a couple of them. Mm -hmm. I think one was maybe his male helper friend. So then that begs the question, is this some kind of deliberate thing like where the Klingons had some kind of, you know, change because of the, the you whatever the the mutations that were going on in the, the various Klingon stories. I wonder if something's going on with the Romulans there too. Mm. I don't know if you noticed any of that, Sirach, but that's kind of what's, they're kind of teetering back and forth from character to character. Uh, yeah, I didn't notice it in that way. I actually noticed it in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, what I thought was interesting was the Romulans are normally these really abrasive, uh, almost like a, uh, similar to Klingons in the way that they're, you know, matter of fact about their business. Right. Uh, behavioral differences. Be yeah. Behavioral differences. So I noticed that, that these Romulans that, that are living with Picard, they act, they act differently. They don't have the same kind of uh, military, you know, even though they have the expertise, they don't necessarily have the same projection of a rough exterior of a rough, texture to their uh, persona they seem more mild and you know like you said hipsters and you know they, they're more casual about their existence it make made me think okay maybe is that's a cultural is that a cultural change now you're talking about the physical thing and i'm saying well is it a cultural thing if you're disassociated and you're more of a uh, melting pot environment right right um, so we live in California and we have all these different nationalities here and you see a melting pot, uh, culturally changes people. So people that would normally be traditional, wherever their home country is like a Chinese or a traditional Armenian, when they get to a melting pot environment here in California, they, everybody's like going to the beach and driving a BMW and, you know, we're all, and they, they lose some of their, I, their traditional identity signifiers and become more uh, uh, part of the popular culture. You know, uh, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought of that, but now that you mention it, their behavior, these Romulans, at least the ones that live with Picard, are acting like humans. You know, they're acting human. They're acting regular. They, they are Romulans. They have Romulan knowledge and Romulan, Romulan connections they don't act like Romulans, you know, they're, they're not cutting their bowl cut. They're not being super sinister and sneaky and insidious and, and aggressive. You know, they don't have all these ploys yet. We do know that, uh, fast forwarding Commodore O, uh, the lady that is, seems to be at the top of some kind of, hierarchy of uh conspiracy yeah and they're and they're probably the the group that they're mentioning at the very beginning which is at the, the, the jot jot Vash. exactly jot Vash. they're talking about that so she must be there they're, they've got to be alluding to the fact that they're the jot Vash, as well as her young lieutenant um who ends up being uh the one dude's sister so she's acting very romulan and so is the sister and possibly the dude. So maybe we're just attributing all the negative and villainous, you know, uh, traits to be Romulan. And then the nice Romulans were like, ah, oh, they seem very human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It speaks to our biases. It, it speaks to our bias uh, and, you know, which way we lean in favor of, right? We're, we're obviously leaning in favor of the humans on, the, on these shows. But... It's it's interesting for me that uh, one thing was interesting is how the depth of knowledge that the Romulans that are living with Picard have 
both with the Jat Vash and the secret uh, kind of cabal, they called it. Right. Uh, they did, yeah. Um, of people that are, uh, you know, part of this ancient Romulan culture, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, and they, you're right, they, were, they, they show things and demonstrate things in Star Trek very responsibly. They want to make sure that we know these Romulans that are refugees are not just these helpless, stupid, ignorant, useless people that are just out plowing his fields. They want us to be fully aware that these are extremely capable, intelligent people that they they still know things, they still have skills, they still have connections and theories and, you know, are very useful in many ways. Uh, so, you know, kudos to Star Trek for always, you know, being cognizant of that. And I'm sure it's not an accident. We know it's deliberate. Yeah. And there was, there's a several things there that they give that are tells. One of them is when they are inside of the crime scene trying to reenact what happened with this girl inside of her apartment when her, her black friend was killed in the beginning. Um, in the very beginning. In the very beginning, yeah. Uh, so she's reconstructing the, you know, the way it happened. And she says something to the effect of, well, no, Picard says, oh, you're using that technology, that thing is old and unreliable and it's, it's no good. Right. And she says, yeah, that's what we wanted you to think. <laughs> yeah, you know, really? so. You know, uh, that also reminds me very quickly, I do want to give us a quick update from last week. A lot of the questions that we posed last week, we got answers to this week. One was the friend uh, that died right away. We were wondering if he's an alien we've seen before. We have seen it in Discovery. Uh, the character Poe, she's the queen from some wacky planet. She has a really long name, but Tilly just calls her Poe. It's a Zahian. So he is the second Zahian that we've seen, the first being in Discovery. Um, also, uh, those two Romulan characters, you asked, have we seen those characters before? Um, and I said, no, I don't remember ever seeing them. Turns out those two characters are in a Picard comic book, uh, Countdown Issue Number 2. So if you want to know more about those characters, it's in Picard Countdown Issue Number 2. Also, upon reviewing uh, the episode... Those, of the same, those same two characters? Correct. Picard's buddies, yeah. Okay. Uh, it was the D... Picard does dream about the D, not the E. The, it was the Enterprise D, uh, that model. And here's one that I think is possibly the most interesting. Uh, somebody captured a screenshot when it shows downtown Boston in episode one. And there are two really cool things there. There are a few, but two especially. One is that there's a Ferengi Alliance symbol the, the, the Ferengi symbol, but it's elongated that kind of looks like a beverage. So it kind of tells us, well, the Ferengi are doing, doing business. They're doing really well there downtown uh, Boston and on Earth. And the other one, even cooler, uh, is Cassidy Yates. Is on a big electronic billboard. It says Cassidy Yates. It's like her, her ship, her freighter company. So it shows that two of our favorites from Deep Space Nine are doing very well. Cassidy Yates is now a big, successful person within her company. And the Ferengi, under Grand Negus Rom, with, uh, with Nog and with Lita, are doing really well. So it's, it was really cool to see that. Oh, wow. So they did have some little gems there that they inserted to kind of uh, pay homage to the the... the storyline uh, the story arc absolutely yeah uh the timeline is consistent so that's that's awesome that they did that i didn't see the cassidy yates it's uh, it's very hard to see it's just there's a screenshot and you kind of got to zoom in and look at it but it's there it says cassidy yates it's her freighter company wow so so we're moving up the ds9 people didn't go away we're still here uh, and it shows uh it shows uh kurtzman and, and company's attention to detail that they want to, it's kind of like what we were saying before, which is the, the non-appearance mentions. You know, they give these subtle nods that say, hey, Ferengi are still around. Cassidy Yates is still doing around and she's doing very well. It's just letting us know these, it's like little Easter eggs for us. 
Yeah, that's great. And maybe one day Picard will stop by Cisco's Creole Kitchen and get him some jambalaya. <laughs> 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 so, but no, that's 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 a great little uh, jewel that they just uh, inserted in there. And I, I remember seeing the scene, but obviously there's so much stuff going on, all the buildings, you can't, unless you freeze frame it, you can't study it in the in the course of uh, it passing by. But even so, they still put it in there, which is great. Yeah, so special thanks to all the fans that found those things, the ones that posted those and the ones that showed it to us and answered the questions for us. That's really cool. And, and it's really cool that the, that the people that are making Star Trek, they trust the fans. They say, we're going to put this tiny thing in for one second, and they're going to find it. You know? <laughs> and they yeah. do. They do. And they did. They, they <laughs> found it, all right. Um, so yeah, no, I, I I enjoyed this episode uh, for some reason more than the first one. I don't okay. know why. Um, things that jumped out at me was the music again. I I paid attention to the scoring, and the music just kept me moving through the the the, the film. It just was beautifully paced. Um, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Did you hear? Did you hear those? Just the background. Uh, you, you hear there were some nice Star Trekian themes in there for a while. Then there was also the the piccolo, uh, which is a, a Picard thing from Next Generation, but it's also in the theme song. But you're right. I mean, there I really love you know their attention to scoring and the quality of scoring. I mean, big big kudos for that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it stood out. Uh, even the scene where. Uh, Picard is sitting there with Mor Dr. Maurice, his doctor, Maurice, right? Maurice. Uh, yeah, there was even scoring in that scene. So it's, it's still, uh, it wasn't just two guys talking with the si dead silence. There was background ambient sound and it, 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 it plays to the emotions of the scene. And it's just a great touch. So I have to give a big shout out to whoever's scoring mm -hmm. uh, this show. Uh, <clears throat> I also want to, yeah. No, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna uh, go back to the the doctor scene, but finish your thought. Yeah. No, I, and I, and then I was gonna start uh, going to start to go into the special effects and the visual effects and uh, how good that is as well. Right, right. Uh, I was taken away. For example, one of the scenes that was interesting and just visually was great was when they kind of take us from space past all the ships into the board cube and they kind of go through the cube and you're like going through it and you finally land into the scene where they're uh in the bed together i think if, if i'm not mistaken yeah, but it was right. just it was it was just great to see that because you're like you feel like you're there you're floating in through it you, you get the ins and outs of both the exterior and interior and i like that shot and to me, it was just another thing to me. I was like, wow, this is great visual effects, great special effects, and directing-wise for us to get to this place. It was a great, seamless transition. Yeah, the the quality is top-notch. That's something that has been present with Discovery and is present in Picard. The quality and the production value is through the roof. Um, we are going to take a super fast break in just a second. I just want to say that we'll, we'll come back and talk about the doctor for sure because there was some some really cool things about that and also i want to uh talk about one of the characters i think should have a different name um and the spittle bugs on the pinos i mentioned that but we'll, <laughs> he did <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that on the other side we'll be right back with the seventh rule hey everybody welcome back to the seventh rule with sirak lofton aka jake cisco from deep space nine the best writer in the alpha quadrant <laughs> My name is Ryan T. Husk. We are reviewing episode two of Star Trek Picard. And uh, we were talking about, oh, real quick, Spittlebugs on the Pinos. Picard says something like, oh, you, I don't have to worry about the Spittlebugs on the Pinos or whatever he says. <laughs> yeah. And so, of course, what did I do? I, I Googled Spittlebugs. I'm like, is that a real freaking thing? And it is. And the reason it's called Spittlebugs is because they create they're like on plants and they create, they house themselves in these bubbles that looks like little pieces of like cotton mouth spittle, right? Mm. And I remember now I get those things. 
I get those in my rosemary. And at first, when I first saw it, like years ago, I thought my roommate was just spitting in my rosemary, but I'm like, ew, that's disgusting. And then when he wasn't there anymore, I thought, oh, maybe it's rosemary just has like sap. It's like some weird bubbly, fiddly sap. And now I was today years old when I found out that that was. <laughs> it's a real bug. thing. Yeah, that, that does yeah. that. Uh, no, I, I, I did not know about the spittle bugs. Uh, yeah. I'm glad you did that bit of research because that just enlightens us on how how much depth that the writers have. I think that's one thing that really goes unnoticed. I mean, to know about uh, the mechanics of computers, you know, the server, the pro, I had to get here, I had to get, we have to download the router into this. They know all the computer stuff. They have to know all the futuristic like ways to bring things to life. You know, they had a scene here with the the cell phone computer stick that had all the records of the calls and and whatnot. So they're they're thinking of all these innovative ways and just depth of understanding that they have of of uh, of mythology, right? You know, of um, detail for sure. yeah, of of medicine. You know, they, 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 we talk about the mycelial network and all of these things, right? Uh, yeah. So, I, but I'm just saying you're talking about covering a lot of things and with with respect to religion and uh, medicine and mythology. And now here you're talking about uh, biology with spittle bugs. I just give it a lot of I give them a lot of credit for having uh, a wealth of knowledge. These guys are nuts. They're not dumb people. They're very smart, very articulate, and they do a great job of uh, giving us their knowledge in this format right. and dropping their jewels. So, uh, shout out to the, to the people that are doing this Picard show. Awesome job. Right. The, the producers definitely have a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of, uh, assets. I'm sure that, you know, they have the budget to say, Hey, what's a, what's, what's a pest in, you know, whatever, you know, and so they can Google it or they can ask and they can pay an expert, you know, to come, visit the writer's room for the day and give them information or whatever they, they do. But yeah. however they get to that information, they could be Googling or reverse engineering or like find a, find a bug that affects wine plants. <laughs> but it, it just, it just means that they're thinking about those and they're, they're mm-hmm. putting the, the time and effort to give us the details that matter. Right. Right. Definitely. <clears throat> so I do want to uh, go back and talk about that doctor now. Uh, for for a few reasons, number one is uh, Sirach the Stargazer is known to be Captain Picard's first captaincy before he went on the Enterprise. So, um, so we've only heard a few scattered stories about his days on the Stargazer, but he does remember it fondly. Like he'll sometimes go and say, "Oh, you know, it's like the good old days on the Stargazer," and now we finally get to meet one of his favorite people from the stargazer who uh, was his doctor. And what I liked about that also was the doctor's name. Let me see if I can find it. It was Moritz. Moritz Benayoun. And I always find the, their choices of names interesting because Benayoun is definitely some kind of uh, Arabic or Middle Eastern or Israeli kind of last name. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, you know, that's another thing that's attention to detail. It's all it just just the character's name tells us a story, you know, and I really like that. Absolutely. So it was a good character, good scene. Uh what do you think about it? Uh I've seen that doctor before. I want to re- I, I don't know what it, it's a it's a mafia movie that he was in, I I think. And <laughs> really? I'm, yeah, I'm big on mafia movies, so I'm pretty sure he played in one of these fav- my favorite mafia movies. So as soon as I saw the actor, I was like, oh, man, I know this guy. He's like one of those guys that you see and you know his face and you wonder what was the scene that he did that that made that burned him into my memory. Right. It's there's something. And I, I I'm guessing it's a mafia scene. I didn't really look into it, but I like the actor and I like the way he portrayed that character. Uh, yeah, I'm look right now. I'm looking at while you talk. I'm looking through his IMDb because it is extensive, as you might Ex- guess. Yeah, yeah. He's he's the type of guy that's you know been in so many different things, and I'm, I just wonder what is this the thing that I am attaching to my memory when I see him. 
right? Mm-hmm. But he's a fantastic actor, and I like the delicacy with which he approached this particular scene because he's giving Picard bad news, essentially. He's a good friend of him, uh, a good friend of his, and Picard is reaching out to him to get this fate. Like, I need you to make sure that I'm eligible to be intergalactic. Right, right. Like, you know, so... Um, as a matter of fact, he starts off, he says, for a relic, you're in excellent shape. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I like that line, like right off the top, he just started jabbing at, you know, his old friend, you know. Um, and then he said something, he closed the scene with, I thought was a really poignant line as well. Um, he said, you really want to go back out into the cold knowing, right. you know, and that that was a big question that he poses for me to Picard. It's like, like, do you want to really do this, bro? You know, is he? Do you 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 realize what your options are and what you're facing? This is not looking good. You're probably sooner or later. And then I think he even says, um, "Well, maybe the ship will kill you before." <laughs> You know, like maybe your adventures will kill you before whatever this illness is. Yeah, it, it's it's hinting that he may have aromatic syndrome, I believe. They haven't fully said it, but in the final two-part episode of Next Generation, which is, uh, for my money, it's the best uh, final episode, all good things, uh, best two-parter. I think that the best... Uh, pilot first two episodes was deep space nines for sure emissary possibly picard being second uh but uh next generation uh in all good things he they they find that there's there's a defect in his head in the parietal lobe that can lead to all kinds of things including aromatic syndrome which is i believe a made-up thing and then when they flash forward like 30 years in the future he has it he's an old man that's hallucinating and you know whatever so this is showing kind of that coming into being this is like 19 or 20 years later and the doctor is saying hey i found this defect in your parietal lobe and that explains you know like kind of hallucinations and bad dreams Mood swings yeah exactly and it makes you kind of wonder when he's talking for example with that admiral uh the blonde haired admiral lady or white haired and she's kind of being a little extra rude to him right and then makes right. you is she really being that rude or is he imagining it being worse than it really is? We don't, I don't really know, but maybe. Uh, Yeah. Or is he, or is his condition making him be abrasively rude? Right. Right. I think Mm -hmm. she says, she says something to the effect like, the nerve of you what is she say? Sheer, yeah, something like that sheer effing hubris is what she said yeah says. hubris that's what it was right you're right yeah she says sheer effing hubris and because he says i'm prepared to you know even be demoted to captain you know something yeah, like that. I'll, oh you know i'll take a pay rate or i'll pay yeah. down real quick yeah. yeah you know i'm prepared to be demoted to captain like if that's what it takes, you know, she's like, you fucking, what do you think you got it all figured out you, yeah who the fuck are you who yeah, says who, i want you back yeah so I thought that was, <coughs> once again, another great scene. Yeah. Excuse can me. we can we talk about for a moment, there's a character. So now we found out that there's a dynamic between uh, Narek and the Lieutenant Rizzo. Turns out she's a Romulan and she's his sister. And now we're starting to see the makings and the hierarchy of this cabal. There's... Commodore O, who's in Starfleet, like one of the highest people in Starfleet, but who's infiltrated, she's a Romulan. Then you have Narek and Lieutenant Rizzo, or whatever her real name is. One thing I did want to say, Narek is a very, very clearly a a British actor who talks with a British accent and acts very British. And I was thinking, instead of calling him Narek, can we just call him like Narold? You know, like <laughs> <laughs> like and this is my and this is Nerald. Uh, oh Nerald, I'm the, the Romulan Nerald over here. Sir Nerald. <laughs> Nerald of High Castle. Oh. What do you think? Will that fly? The Duke of Romulus. <laughs> no. The thing that I thought was interesting is that he looks <coughs> excuse me. 
Ciroc, that's too many. <laughs> Ciroc was eating a, uh, a bunch of nuts beforehand. So yeah. On an almond. I don't know what it is. So, uh, <clears throat> but he looks like uh, the new Spock in Discovery. Right. A lot of people notice that too. Yeah. He just looks there's like. There's this like, Spock. you know, there's this, the way they shave, the, the way they shave. I guess they go to the same barber, but there is this kind of rough look to them and this bad boy kind of look and i think they both have it's i actually have to double check if it's not the same actor playing both characters yeah or the same guy <laughs> handing you your latte at starbucks <laughs> <laughs> so but yeah so they have that uh this guy coming in and he does have a british accent i mean but i i don't really i don't fault them for that nah. because you know the romulan that we talked about earlier uh one of Picard's Romulan housemates, uh, uh, she speaks with an Irish accent. Yeah, or Scottish or something. Yeah. Scottish or Irish accent. And that's okay because it just uh, means that maybe they spent some time in Ireland or England. You know, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay for me. It, I, I, it doesn't make me say, oh, this is, this is ridiculous. I, I, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> it no, doesn't it, bother can, me. it can be explained away in universe. They could say, well, they spent their first two years learning English in England. Okay. Answered. Got it. Answered. There it is. Um, I thought what was cool was this. I, I made a little picture of it, but it's that little visitor. Yes. Hold the on. The visitor me logo. Pull that up that, again. Yeah, this is, this is the... Uh, visitor pin. Yeah, the little visitor pin that Picard had to wear when he was visiting with the admirals there. And I thought that was... <laughs> there it is. There it is. We got that at the uh at the premiere in Hollywood, the Hollywood premiere hand. Oh, did we? Out. Yeah. Oh, geez. Check I your kinda... little uh check your little two year old girl backpack that they gave us. Oh uh, okay. There. Really cool, really awesome. Yeah, so I like that. Um it was a little cool little touch that they put on there. The other thing I liked and I made a little another picture of it is the teleportation uh metal detector checkpoints mm -hmm. that they had. So people going in and out of work were like just beamed out as they were walking through this thing. They were appearing and disappearing, which I thought was pretty cool as well. Can I just allow my my nerdy uh, Vulcan ears to point out for a second and nitpick that piece of technology? Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, it really needs to be separate teleporters for with one way access only like these teleporters are specifically for arrivals and these teleporters are specifically for departures because what you have is people going into these teleportation devices and out back and forth constantly <laughs> they're going to get they're going to get materialized <laughs> each other yeah. because when, when, when somebody's rematerializing, if somebody just happens to be walking there, because it's very likely somebody, they're going to rematerialize inside of somebody else. So come on, guy. That, that, when I first saw that, I was like, come on, just get, have them all one way things. Right. This because, is the exit. This is the entrance. Yeah. Because otherwise people are going to materialize into each other. Anyway. Yeah. No, I, cool, I, I, I didn't think of it that way. Obviously, you went into it. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is a nitpick and that's what we do when we nitpick we get we dive in deeper into something that doesn't jive with our you know spidey sense so i i i'm not upset with that uh critique but it visually did look something cool it, it i understand right. the idea of what they were trying to accomplish mm -hmm. and it was kind of a, a cool little idea it was basically a metal detector that beams you in and out right that was cool <laughs> Um, but there were some great lines in this. We, I want to give a shout out to the dialogue, the, the script writers, the teleplay. Yeah. Any of them that stand out to you? Yeah. One of them was, she, I really enjoyed the back and forth between Picard and his, his higher ups. Right. And one of the things she said, a, a once, she's like a once great man, desperate to matter. That's what she, that's what she calls him, and it's like, oh, oh, that was tough. And uh, then she says, "Do what you're good at. Go home." Oh, <laughs> and it was another sting, and another like, kick oh. in the teeth. Yeah, I was like, whoa, that's a lot. 
So I thought the I thought the dialogue was good. Those were those were some good lines. That lady, uh, Admiral Kirsten Clancy, played by Anne Magnuson. So that's who that was. Yeah. And Commodore O is played by an actress named Tamlin Tomita. FBI. Both did very good jobs. I yeah. enjoyed their performances. Uh, acting's been great in this series so yeah. far. What do you think? You know, I think the acting's been great. Yeah, I don't have any problem with the acting. I like the the uh, science doctor that they brought in. I like the Romulans that he has. Mm -hmm. um, and I like the girl that they have the twins of, you know, the twin girl. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I like her she's as well. Brion is, yeah. Yeah, she's... She's uh, she's something special to watch. She has that it factor. Um, so yeah, no, I'm not at all bothered by the acting. I think it's really good acting so Me too. far. Um, we had the Earl Grey reference as well in this one. You know, what kind of tea would you like? Yes, you know, I was thinking something that would have just been hilarious is because, of course, we already got the Earl Grey nod, which was cool. But then this time, when he says, "Would you like some tea?" And she says, oh, how about some Earl Grey? She says, oh, good choice or whatever, you know. I but, knew there was something special. About it. <laughs> yeah. But what if, what if she, instead she says, how about some English breakfast? And he like her up like, oh, I'm going to rumble, grumble. <laughs> no, English, English breakfast. breakfast. Yeah, come drinking. <laughs> supposed to be smart. <laughs> you know, that would have uh, been good. That would have been good. I was hoping for it. You know, Patrick Stewart said he hates the taste of, of Earl Grey. For in real life, he says it. It's like uh, lawnmower clippings, is what he called it. Oh wow, I like wow. it. Yeah, I, I I put so much honey and sugar <laughs> and in my tea that you wouldn't know what kind of tea it was, anyways. It's it's unrecognizable. Like, uh, it's unrecognizable. It's kind of like Starbucks coffee is really just like syrup. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's pretty much that. So you you wouldn't know what I'm drinking. So what is this? A milkshake? <clears throat> but uh, there was another line that I liked also going back to the dialogue and, and, and the yeah. words. <clears throat> she says, you already slept with me. That makes you an accessory to my plot. I, I, yeah. I like that little uh, pillow talk. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it was. Yeah. It was a little line, bit of a, yeah. A line that was really good on, on that subject that I really liked was when Commodore O is talking with Lieutenant Rizzo and Commodore O kind of brings her up to speed and says, hey, this is going on. That's going on. This is bad. Uh, Lieutenant Rizzo, who, by the way, we find out it's her people that are the ones that are going out and then that, and kill Dodge. Um, so we know that they're behind all of this. They're behind the Romulans, you know, that are in the mass. They're behind the the guys going to kill Dodge and everything. It's, you know, she's basically at the top. Commodore O is for now. And her right-hand lady is Lieutenant Rizzo. And when she tells her it's not going well, Lieutenant Rizzo says, this is unexpected. And Commodore O says, a dirty word, especially in our line of work. Ooh. Ooh. That's good because their their job is to know everything, plan for everything, expect everything. I, that was my favorite line. Yeah, and they're they're <clears throat> building up this Romulan secret group. Uh, have they talked about this Jacques Bosch before? Or this is something new. I've never heard it. I think this is the first time. I think this is a new element that they are bringing in. Yeah, and the way they described it was. Uh, the older cabal, the secret keepers that have a deep loathing hate for synthetic life. <clears throat> Illuminati. Yeah, well, basically, <laughs> that's the, they were kind of making those kind of references. So it was this secret society that's trying to take people out. And I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, yeah. And the Tal Shiar, which was what we always knew, that's kind of like, you know, the, the Secret Service or the, the CIA or whatever or the spies, uh, they're kind of like their front or their puppets, you know, but these are like the even farther, you know, darker, more infiltrating group. Yeah. So it's kind of like what we're seeing, what we saw with the Jem'Hadar and the Dominion, right? right. Mm -hmm. One, one's the front for the other. Uh, right. 
<clears throat> or the muscle or whatever you want to call it. But yeah, like Wayun was kind of like what they all thought was the main guy until they found out that the founders were even behind him. That's what I mean. Exactly. And, yeah. And the, the Borda. Right. Yeah. So uh, the only, uh, you know, it was funny because the one nitpick I had was when they were, when the two, uh, the two girls were in the, uh, inside the, the Borg cube and they were doing, they, they saw Noir, Noir, Romulan. Oh, Nerald? You mean Nerald? Yeah. When they saw <laughs> Nerald, they were like, wow, I didn't know Romulans could be so hot. And I and I thought it, she would have said something to the fact like back off that's my <laughs> I just slept with the guy thirty minutes ago oh, he's not talking about him like that I didn't I thought she would be a little bit more possessive but she did not I also want to ask the people listening in uh, to tell us in the comments below how hot is Nerald like is he is he like you know because they're like. I didn't like the way she was making it sound was like this yeah. is a Greek god yeah. I'm looking at here, and so I want to know is is this guy a Greek god or you know I don't know what do you think? Yeah, that's uh, that was my question. I was like, all right, this is awkward. It was awkwardly placed line. It's like, all right, they're attracted to, uh, you know, that's fine. But for him to be that blow away, drop dead gorgeous, that two girls that just met each other, right, would talk about it like that. I just didn't think that was gonna be. It didn't didn't jive with me he ain't no brad pitt and right now there's millions of women going oh that's because you guys just never listen to girl talk you guys are never in our inner circle so you don't know <laughs> yeah, you don't know what we, we talk have about no idea <laughs> <laughs> we don't fair enough that's a fair enough exchange i double listen to the you know now that we're getting it uh i can already feel the theme song growing on me i don't know if you can beautiful well. yeah I, I watch watch it again, and now as you keep rewatching it, it starts to like, oh, okay, and now and then I start to hear it, and it it becomes more familiar to me. Right. So I I can almost autumn I can almost see the day where I'll be able to hum it, and hum it, right? Yeah, I remember when we first heard it at the Hollywood premiere. I was like, oh, this is beautiful. We're gonna love it. I mean, you could you already knew it was gonna be great. You could already love it. But you know it's going to take a few more listens before it, it becomes, as you said, familiar. And, and I liken to it to, for me, the Game of Thrones uh, song. When I first heard it, I was like, yeah, it's nice, but it's kind of boring or there isn't much to it. Yeah, it's then generic. Once, yeah, but then yeah. once you got used to the Game of Thrones thing, you're like, oh, man, this is a great theme song. And I think that's what's going to happen with this is once people get used to it, they're going to really like it. You know, it's going to get stuck in their head. They're going to play it. Yeah, <clears throat> I, uh, <clears throat> I'm i glad to have rewatched this episode. I got us, when you when we originally were at the premiere, we saw the episodes, uh, you know, connected in, you know, back to back to back. So mm -hmm. uh, seeing them separate is allowing me to really kind of get, okay, that's the story they wanted to tell for this particular. Um, it's great that they can run it in sequence. Um, but it's also great for me to just sit down and digest this part and just say, okay, let me see, do I like this episode or not? And in this particular episode, I liked it. Uh, I thought it was mm. a good episode. Um, everything that we talked about from the music to the special visual effects to the dialogue, I was spot on point. I really don't have too much criticism for this, this show. Yeah, and they, and they keep giving us a, a ton of Easter eggs. Uh, another one that wasn't really an Easter egg, but just something really cool was when Picard walks into Starfleet headquarters, which is, I believe that's Starfleet headquarters, which was at, you know, at San Francisco um, that we all know and love. And he walks into the lobby, which kind of looked like the Getty Center. I don't know if it was, but it like the Getty Center here in uh, LA. Yeah. But he walks in and he looks up on the ceiling and he sees the old Constitution class Enterprise from the original series. And then that hologram changes into the Enterprise D, which was his uh, ship. And so that, that was a really nice thing. You know, it, it gives us a little warmth in our heart to see those ships we love. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you brought that scene up because I wrote down here also in my notes that it was a funny moment when he's checking in. And the guy's like, you know, he's like, I'm here for the meeting. And yeah. 
And the guy's looking at him like, all right. What's your name? name? Yeah, what's your name? (laughs) (laughs) And Picard, the way he says it is exactly how James Bond says his name. Hmm. So they always say, hey, what's your name? He says, Bond. James James Bond. Bond. (laughs) And when Picard says it, he says, Picard. Jean-Luc Picard. And I've had it. Didn't he spell it out too? <laughs> Didn't you have to spell it out for that kid? Yeah. Like the guy's like, am I supposed to know you? Gramps? I don't know what, you smell like Earl uh, Grey, dude. You smell like Earl Grey and Mothball. Picard with an H or a K? <laughs> well. Yeah, it was, it was funny though. There's was, was, was good moments and it's actually a joy to kind of watch uh, Patrick Stewart doing his thing and, and getting his mojo back. Yeah. So we've got uh, just a little less than a minute left uh, before we got to run. I do want to tell everybody at home that uh, we also do a series in which we watch, rewatch, and review Deep Space Nine episodes with Sirach Lofton and various uh, special guests here and there. So it's really fun and cool to see Jake Sisko rewatching his old episodes and his old for buddy. the first time for the first time so i guess it's not really re-watching but yeah <laughs> watching <laughs> you get to join Sirach in his very first viewings i mean he was a part of them but watching them for the first time has been really fun uh we've done 50 episodes of that so far so definitely check that out uh in uh we've got just a couple seconds left final thoughts on this uh not really i just thank everybody for the support uh all of our producers um mm. everybody's has been along the way thanks for uh you know rest in peace aaron eisenberg and melissa who's been uh just steadily contributing and being there for us um, sure. so we just want to say thank you to everybody who supported us and continue to support us so we appreciate it perfect i totally agree Melissa, it has been wonderful. Aaron Eisenberg, uh, who started this whole thing, uh, brought us all together. Special thanks to him, our superstar. And also special thanks to Imo Radka, Rex Wood, Dennis Koch, Homer Frizzell, the commander, Eve England, and Kat R. King, also our Trek tech, Heather Jordan. Thank you all. And we'll see you next week on The Seventh Rule.